What kind of behavior is this x-ray going to have? What do we have in this setting? We have patients. We have doctors. We have nurses. We have x-ray technicians. So for every one of these stakeholders, there are different classes of stakeholders. So for that object, you create memory segments that deals with that class of data, including the conversations between these people. And this is a very key point, which really is part of our uh, six patents that we filed, that these agents not only know about themselves, but they also know about their stakeholders, and they also are responsible for managing communication between the stakeholders and storing the information and the conversations between the stakeholders, but also regulating it. So when the doctor talks to the patient, that goes into a different memory segment. So it really, this architecture describes in detail how to approach a complete fundamental rethinking of software from first principle in the AI age for the AI as a platform. You want to know why AI is eating software? Because the way that we think about AI is probably all wrong. AI isn't just another tool in the software stack. It's a completely new platform that may make much of traditional software obsolete. And consider this, you want to write an email. Do you now go to Gmail, then go to another software, Word, then go to Grammarly, then go back to Word, or do you be open up something like ChatGPT, start a conversation that can create it, refine it, and send it? My name is Declan Dunn, and I help entrepreneurs, small businesses, and creators take advantage of AI before it takes advantage of them. And in episode 67, AI Eats Software, Tiny AI Agents Beat Big AI, I'm talking with CEO Masood Alabash of Omadeus in part two of our interview. See, we're still all forcing AI into this 40-year-old approach built around files, folders, and applications. A model that digitized paper, put it in the computer, but still made us act like we're using paper, shuffling it around, organizing it, and communicating about it. Isn't that what AI is supposed to do? See, the companies that understand this, like Omadeus, aren't just building better software tools. They're building the next computing platforms. Are you ready to step out of the Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, 1980s time tunnel of software and into something new? Well, in full disclosure, I am. And after interviewing Masood again, I've joined Omadeus as an advisor. Because for me, this makes so much sense. See, together, these mini AI agents and a smaller model makes your business smarter, life easier, and it won't threaten to take over. But I'll let Masood do the explaining. AI agents everyone's talking about, but yours is a very different approach. You combine structured data, natural language communications, along with the related documents, media resources like video, audio, internet links, but it also includes the relevant stakeholder identities and human resources within the object itself. So the object uses all this information to continuously keep itself updated using the LLM as a communication tool. In this way, you're talking about humans are freed from the burden of organizing and routing yeah. information in the system. Oh, holy crap! That, that you know, humans are the least reliable uh, element yeah. in the in routing and managing information in a corporate setting. We cobble up uh, tools like Trello and Slack and email and try to figure out how to coordinate everything. But uh, because they're based on the old form paradigms, they basically become message peddlers of dumb messages back and forth. So uh, it's all really about communication. And, and this is really our fundamental problem, which AI can resolve from its root. But to do that, we need to rethink software completely in the world of AI from uh, first principles. And uh, the, the old way of creating software was basically automating physical forms, sticking them on the computer. Now in the age of AI, now if I quickly go in, uh, to where ChatGPT burst onto the scene, and essentially these large language models uh, are word calculators, uh, if you will. Uh, you know, they, they take input as words and they put uh, words as outputs. Now they had they have a lot of uses. Uh, don't get me wrong, but in terms of applying it 
in a uh, generic way across the board to the fundamental problems that we're dealing with in, uh, in our production setting, in our companies, they have extremely limited, uh, are limited in terms of their utility. And we're quickly discovering that. And that's why agents popped on, on the scene because LLMs were these uh, language uh, uh, machines that were probabilistic machines that spit out words to make them interact with the world, we attached algorithms uh, to these uh, language models and call them agents. I think, they, um, I think that that's a better definition of agents. It's algorithms attached to language models. In our view, when you combine probabilistic machines with uh, deterministic uh, machines, you basically have created uh, uh, agents. I mean, that's basically what, uh, in an abstract way, that's what they are. And they make LLMs much more useful. Uh, you can imagine, like in your Alexa, when you tell your tell Alexa, uh, you know, turn on the light, if it just says, okay, I will do it, uh, well, in order to turn the light on, it has to execute an algorithm to interact with the outside world. So, the, you know, the notion of agency came uh, in making LLMs more useful. Now, this is an evolutionary process we're going through, but uh, we took a completely different path, you know, grappling with this uh, fundamental problem of uh, uh, managing information and routing information. Uh, over 200 people uh, uh, finding different tools, figuring out how, what they're good for and writing code and tying, tying them together to streamline them because we're a tech company. It never really worked. And our uh, uh, epiphany came when we understood that the, the model is flawed. The model is a basic form automation. It's the, it's the the old paper forms that were stuck on the computer. And that's what we're really doing. Even with the GUI stuff, we made those forms prettier, but the fundamental view of looking at data and algorithm was the same. It's like, basically, these are forms on the screen capturing data and sticking in them in a database or routing it to somebody else. So really, this is a dumb exchange of information. Well, what we did is we kind of turned this thing on its head and said, look, what if data was intelligent? What if the data itself had intelligence and it had autonomy? So if you can imagine your system, now thinking about uh, rethinking software from first principles in the AI age to make AI native software, if we now, instead of starting with workflow processes and, and data flow processes, start identififying these critical entities is our, in our setting and give them intelligence and awareness and give them understanding of the workflow and give them understanding of the stakeholders. For example, the x-ray knows that's the patient, that's the doctor. This is the X-ray technician, just like an individual. That X-ray entity gains memory segments. So it knows that if he's talking to the doctor, this is information that he cannot share with the X-ray technician, for example. And these uh, entities can gain autonomy in a way that they are responsible for managing all the information about themselves. All right, be honest. Are you starting to get that knee-jerk reaction that these agents will just take over like everyone else is promising about the big AI? Well, see, tiny language models, small AI, is really not designed that way. And what you're feeling is a survival mechanism. Hey, the question is smart. We're about to discover how these mini agents working for us will not take over because it's not in their interests. Why would they take over? They just serve your file and how to communicate and organize around what that file does instead of making you do it. Trust me, if you listen, you're gonna see that this is a very different way of doing things and so much easier. So what if your spreadsheet, for example, could talk to your team? What if your legal briefs and the lawyer coordinated, updated, and streamlined cases? What if you're a developer and your code tells you when it needs help, checks on the timelines, and communicates to everybody involved smarter than one person could do? What about even x-rays, which can ping doctors when needed? By making your files, also known as objects, as Masu calls them, smart, they serve you and only run their little part of your world. The answer is so obvious, but we're all addicted to the dinosaur world of software, and we don't have to be. The evolution of business communication tools, right? You're talking about it, email. Slack and Yammer, enterprise social networks, has created data silos 
and inefficiencies in information routing and workflow management that you're talking about based on people sorting and directing information. But the idea of objects managing their own data and communication sounds like autonomous agents. How do you prevent a system like this from becoming uncontrollable or unpredictable? That's where the job of the designers and the programmers come into play. Basically, what the, the, the new approach in designing these systems is really writing the operating system for your environment to manage the traffic flow of the data. Essentially, what you just beautifully described, saying data silos. The, the data sits there in the database and it's dumb. It has no awareness until an algorithm fetches it and takes it and puts it on a screen so the uh, a viewer can project meaning to this. That data is stupid. It's dumb. It doesn't know anything. But if we go with this completely different model and take that data and give intelligence to that data and give it a set of algorithms that gives it behavior, and those algorithms are the ones that the developers and programmers decide what kind of behavior is this x-ray going to have. So the, the programmers in this case, for example, if you are uh, uh, HIT, health care and technology programmers, we sit there and go, well, what do we have in this setting? We have patients, we have doctors, we have nurses, we have x-ray technicians. So for every one of these stakeholders, there are different classes of stakeholders. So for that object, you create memory segments that deals with that class of data, including the conversations between these people. And this is a very key point, which really is part of our uh, six patents that we filed, that these agents not only know about themselves, but they also know about their stakeholders, and they also are responsible for managing communication between the stakeholders and storing the information and the conversations between the stakeholders, but also regulating it. So when the doctor talks to the patient, that goes into a different memory segment. So it really, this architecture describes in detail how to approach a complete fundamental rethinking of software from first principle in the AI age for the AI as a platform. Great, good enough, right? Let's assume that these mini AI agents can do a better job, but the whole idea of autonomous, self-aware AI agents is easy to see, but why do people think it's gonna go all Skynet because it's smart and does everything? Why does it need us? More importantly, how can we work with it if it doesn't do what we want? In the current way of top-down traditional software, they, these agents couldn't be controlled because they're telling us what to do. They're putting AI in charge. Yet by starting with many AI agents, our output, the files we create, spreadsheets, meetings, code, legal briefs, these are all the things we create. If we wrap intelligence around that, it doesn't have the power we do. The fail saves built in are rules and all these tiny large language models, TLMs, simply manage their own tasks and nothing else, and probably do it better than us. Still with AI agents, even with these mini AI agents, how do you make sure it does what you want it to do? What fail safes exist if an object decides like not to share critical information or in another form, what if it notifies, let's say the person who has this cancer, but it hasn't been validated by the doctor. Does that make sense? What sort of fail safes work with the decision-making process of the object? Okay, so initially, they're limited in terms of what they can do with availability of algorithms to them. Like one algorithm says, feed yourself to this engine and read the report. And if it's uh, this condition, then execute the other algorithm. So, and the other algorithm would be drop yourself to the inbox and follow up with a uh, coordination of an appointment. So the behavior of these, uh, uh, of these objects, it's an intelligent behavior, but it's completely guardrailed by the developers and the creators of the system. Now, on top of it, you have this hierarchical relationship, just like our bodies, uh, where you know, our brain is controlling the overall systemic stuff, but the information or the de detailed processing of, of what happens to a particular liver cell is really completely autonomous to the liver, to the liver cell itself. And it is coordinated by a super object, which is liver. 
your liver cell cannot all of a sudden send a signal to your toe uh, to, to generate pain. It's completely constrained within the liver and all of the functions that it can perform are a set of algorithms that is constrained by the designer of your body, limited to that liver cell. That's the architecture that actually, essentially we're kind of uh, promoting, uh, that you can uh, create these constraints on day one, but what you do is you give the ability of processing natural language to these data entities, and that's really the difference. So really the interactivity of the stakeholders with these objects is through natural language. And if you can imagine that this is a hierarchical system, this is our body basically works the same way in a sense. So following this model, you can build a banking system. You can build a manufacturing automation system. Uh, all the software that we've created needs to be broken down and it needs to be rethought from first principle using this approach to make AI native software. And the benefit of it is that you can interact with it using natural language. Now, here's the best part. This one really got me excited. And Omadeus is not the first to come up with tiny language models, but the way that they're putting it into action to help businesses and individuals manage things and coordinate and organize entire businesses, to me, is very different. See, if you've heard of these big AI models try to do everything, well, these tiny models See, they're experts in your specific work, not jacks of all trades. They know your company's way of doing things. They understand how you and your team like to work, your timing, your schedules, and they coordinate all that communication. Doesn't it make sense? They spot when teams aren't talking to each other, like developers running out code in a sprint, and fix it. This is like having a super smart assistant to do your project. It never sleeps, never forgets, and always has your back. They're laser focused on one thing. They learn about everything about that one thing and become really smart about it. They understand how your team talks and works together and they connect the dots that humans might miss because we're not that great at organizing and communicating. So imagine this, no more chasing people for updates, reports that write themselves, tasks that know where they belong and projects that learn and get smarter. Sounds like magic, but it's just smart AI doing the heavy lifting and the promise that to serve us and actually make our lives easier. Take a listen. How do you address the potential performance, learning curves, and resource issues like auditing, updating that this oh, might that's cause? A, that's a fantastic question. And it's, a, it's worthy of another paper that I'm working on. Uh, well, first of all, when you go to TLMs, that's essentially tiny language models, if I, if I may use that uh, term, it's already been used, but I'd like to use it in this sense that, I mean, you can simulate this with LLMs. And in fact, the, uh, uh, the project management system that we built, we're not using TLMs, we're basically simulating it because, um, you know, if, 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 Software engineers can envision that you can build this system and you can have one central place where all the objects route themselves uh, and, and use that brain, share that brain, if you will, which really runs into that uh, uh, power consumption and processing. But imagine, if you will, uh, if you come up with uh, really these tiny language models and every data element has its own TLM inside it. And these uh, data elements, they can get coagulate and become make a super object. For example, I mean, I can give an example in accounting. Like, let's say every transaction in an account, in an account's receivable, uh, every transaction has its own TLM and it has its own awareness. You know, wasn't one is an expense for lunch or whatever. And the collection of these uh, under accounts receivable, the accounts receivable itself becomes the organ. And so it becomes a super object. Uh, so you can imagine. Uh, all your accounts, so I have accounts payable, accounts receivable, so all these different accounts are, are, are separate and all the transactions underneath them. So this fits nicely in a kind of a, uh, a tree structure, a hierarchical tree structure. You can imagine a kind of a processing, physical or virtual, that every account or even every transaction runs on its own processor and its own memory. And you could actually utilize a parallel processing mode of computation for this kind of architecture. And so you can not only 
improve performance. Uh, imagine, uh, for example, we have a system actually as a project management tool. I'll describe that it fits beautifully to a hierarchical model. And this is some uh, discussion we had with some of the engineers that we could kind of try to simulate that. If you have, like we have projects and each project is broken into sprints. And each sprint contains these uh, uh, items that we call nuggets. And th these items could be a feature request. It could be a bug. Uh, it could So basically, it's typically are features and bugs. So that's the hierarchy. And if I'm doing a search, if I'm looking for something, I can actually send that message to the project object. The project object uh, sends that message to all the sprint objects. The sprint objects send that message down to all the uh, nugget objects. And for example, raise your hand uh, if uh, you are overdue based on your deadline. And so the ones who raise their hands, quickly raise their hands, it bubbles up to the top and the project object comes, here's my list. So you, you could see how that's map, this easily maps to a parallel processing uh, architecture. And utilize it really just maximizes the efficiency. But not only that, using these TLMs, you don't need massive power, massive pro uh, processing power of of, uh, of these uh, large language models. I'm not afraid of AI. I'm afraid of what people will do with AI. All these issues of control and taking over and power, those are people using AI. We keep dreaming that this AGI will take over and there's very little proof that that's even close to happening. And even if it does, why would we set it up that way? Because we're used to that old top-down software model, right? Where you have to buy the software and then everything goes down to the file. This one reverses it and starts with the file and works back up to people. See, an AI agent that just gets lists of our tasks and to-dos that's all based on that 40 plus year old software model where and each one of us has a different to-do list and different ways of organizing ourselves and communicating. Automation is supposed to improve efficiency. And the glaring problem we face as humans is we're really not good at organizing and communicating. So automating what we're not good at doesn't solve the problem. See, the real revolution isn't adding AI features to existing software. Software sort of makes things complex. Building AI agents to automate old workflows. Again, we're just enhancing something that was started in the 80s. Layering intelligence on top of outdated systems when even, like I said in the beginning, if you're sending an email, you don't start with three pieces of software. You start talking to a chatbot and sending the email for you. So the real revolution is letting AI handle organization and communication natively from the file, the object, breaking free from the file folder approach and building from the ground up with AI as the foundation, not that in control. See, AI is not here just to augment our old software models, even though that's what it looks like it's doing in the first wave. It's here to replace them entirely. Imagine a world where you never have to think about file management application switching and integrating it. You ever run a business and brought in a new piece of software? It's hard, you gotta train everybody and it makes things more complex and being organized in a digital world. It's just pure intention and outcome mediated by AI. See, if AI is gonna change the world, how come so many focus on making the way they use software the old way more efficient? The de deal is, the deal is, you need to stress less by forcing you to keep track of everything, especially with more and more happening. You have more time to be creative and solve those problems and watch your ideas come to life faster because you're not busy organizing and making sure everybody knows the communications handled for you. These aren't new tools. This is a platform. AI does not act like software necessarily. It acts to coordinate information around the things you're working on. It's a whole new way of working, trusting your project to be smart so you can have the time to really do what you do better. Ready to work smarter, not harder? I am, and it's not about big AI. It's about tiny AI agents and tiny language models, TLMs to manage it and start thinking that we don't have to be overwhelmed by all the information and meetings in life 
That is something AI can do better. And by giving it control from the bottom up, rather than the way everybody's doing it top down, is actually a better way of doing things. But what do you think? You want to keep working with something that was built in the 80s? Because I know Microsoft and Google and Apple sure would like you to keep working that way. But what if there's something else? That's fascinating to me.